Uh, please. <clears throat> Before I introduce the speakers, first of all, I am Don Schmeltikoff from Baylor University. A couple of ground rules about how we will proceed. We will hear both of the talks first, and then at the conclusion of the second talk, we will open the meeting up to discussion and comments from you and responses from the speakers. And uh, then we will uh, conclude at the appropriate time. There are mics here for you to uh, come to to ask your questions and make your comments. I guess I should say avoid making a speech when you ask your question or make your comment. So we maximize our time here together. It is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Kevin Hart, professor in the Department of English here at the University of Notre Dame. Mr. Hart was born in London. However, he is a citizen of Australia, where he not only received his formal education, but where he also held several academic appointments. These include faculty positions at the University of Melbourne, Deakin University, and Monash University, in the latter serving as Professor of English and Comparative Literature from 1995 to 2002. In 2002, Dr. Hart was named Professor of English here at Notre Dame. And I also want to add that he is pursuing U.S. citizenship, so I guess he'll be around for a while. We hope so. He also has held visiting professorships at Georgetown University, Catholic University in Lewin, Belgium, and Villanova University. Mr. Hart is an accomplished teacher, having already won a teaching award here at Notre Dame and a prolific author. Although his major field is literature, he moves easily and often into theology and philosophy. His most recent books include The Dark Gaze, Maurice Blanchot and the Sacred, Samuel Johnson and the Culture of Property, and The Trespass of the Sign, Deconstruction, Theology, and Philosophy. Mr. Hart has also done extensive work in poetry. He is the editor of the Oxford Book of Australian Religious Verse, and he has published seven collections of poetry, the most recent being Flame Tree Selected Poems. Today he will speak on the subject, Poetry and Evangelizing. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kevin Hart. Thank you very much. I'm not sure what the expression post-Christian culture might mean when proposed as a rubric for this conference. For a Christian, the idea of the post-Christian is unintelligible, since the inner dynamic of Christian practice and reflection discounts the possibility of a conceptual or temporal limit to Christianity. If we step outside belief into sociology, the expression invites us to consider that society no longer identifies itself at large as Christian. The proposition is certainly plausible, but I still find myself puzzled by it, largely because of the context in which I find both it and myself. It would make good sense were it addressing large parts of Europe or the whole of Australia, but I find it difficult to apply directly to the United States. To be sure, America is not a Christian culture in the sense that American domestic or foreign policy brings the figure of Christ frequently to mind. Yet America would surely wish to identify itself as Christian, and without a doubt the recent presidential election has underlined this very insistently. If there is a post-Christian culture in the United States, it is not the dominant political culture, at least not in terms of the people's voting power. Yet the former frames the latter in important ways, and to varying extents. Diverse this post-Christian culture may be, but fragmented it is not. On the contrary, it is a confident secularism tightly bound to an affirmation of religious pluralism. This unity is not as secure or as benign as it seems. Secularism by turns underwrites the possibility of religious pluralism and likes to see itself as an attractive position, tolerant, reflective, enlightened, among others in the spectrum of the religious. There are, as we know, secularists whose rhetoric is indistinguishable from that used by fundamentalists, and there are religious folk, folk whose creeds embrace the secular. 
This unstable mixture of secularism and religious pluralism is advanced in and through the visual media, the highly effective conductor of postmodernity, and consequently it is able to represent itself as the dominant culture. Whoever controls the means of representation controls the representation of meaning. Such would be the cultural logic at issue, and it is a powerful one. Maurice Blanchot observes that man is unmade according to his image, and postmodernity invests very heavily in the claim. We could call this technological mastery of representation and its relentless dissemination a post-Christian culture, but if we do, we should acknowledge that it is not essentially new. We inherit its conceptual matrix from the Enlightenment. We also inherit from the Enlightenment a notion of religion as a genus with the positive religions as species. In this understanding of religion, the truth of the positive religions is ultimately disclosed prior to or above historical revelation. Perhaps there is an America that identifies itself as Christian and another America that identifies itself as enlightened, or if you will, post-Christian. I should make it plain that the latter assertion would be willful, since Christianity is neither thwarted nor diminished by the Enlightenment. The fear of Enlightenment shown by Fideism is a long way from Orthodox faith, as the name of Louis Bautin will remind us. At any rate, I do not know if there are two Americas along the lines I have sketched. I have not lived here long enough to find out. My suspicion is that America, as a concept, is living and dynamic, and at times worrying, precisely because it is the site of this contestation. Needless to say, post-Christian culture is very much at home in the universities, including Notre Dame. To the extent that American universities are modern universities, following Berlin rather than Paris, it must be so, people will say. Myself, I think that Notre Dame should be a sign of contradiction, as the Gospel has it, and fear that it might become a sign of self-contradiction, a Catholic university with faculty who ignore or despise the faith. With that fear in mind, I recall John Paul II's observation in his 1979 encyclical, Redemptor Hominis. He talks there of the mystery of Christ as the basis of the Church's mission and of Christianity, and I quote the Holy Father. If this mission seems to encounter greater opposition nowadays than ever before, this shows that today it is more necessary than ever, and in spite of opposition, this shows, uh, in spite of opposition, more awaited than ever. I would like to consider mystery as the basis of mission, and since this conference is dedicated to epiphanies of beauty, to do so with religion in mind. I can best get to the matters that concern me by placing two short remarks in conjunction. The first comes from the great French lyric poet René Char. He says that poetry is the mystery that enthrones. The second comes from the teaching of Vatican II, specifically from the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. The truth is that only in the mystery of the incarnate word does the mystery of man take on light. Is there any rapport between these two remarks? I doubt it, at least not at the high level of generality that is set by the conjunction. Yet some preliminary investigation might throw up something more interesting than a correlation. The pastoral constitution tells us that being human is not revealed fully or simply by a philosophical anthropology. Rather, a theological anthropology is required, one that is itself grounded in a Christology and a Trinitarian theology. The Council refers to Jesus Christ as the perfect man and elaborates that view by way of the restoration of the Imago Dei. Nothing could be further from the postmodern thought that man is undone by his image. For the coming of Christ is also the coming of the dignity of the human. Before the Council, and speaking from a quite different theological position, Karl Barth, in the Dogmatics, considered Christ as the royal man. In this sense, we could talk of Christ as the mystery that is enthroned. Yet when Shah writes his words, they have a different sense and function than those that Barth would have conceived. Poetry, for Shah, is aligned with the impossible rather than the possible. It cannot be justified on the basis of anything that has been said, including other poems. So when a poem is composed, it is already ahead of itself. It presses into a time to come, a time when it can be found to have meanings 
and to be regarded as a legitimate utterance. On the basis of the poem's speech, the meanings of which are still to be discerned, the writer can be said to be a poet. In the paradoxical style to which Shah is drawn, but which accords with an ancient understanding of inspiration, one becomes a poet only on the basis of poems written. The writer is enthroned, becomes a sovereign spirit, by virtue of the mysterious pressing into the future that is the poem. Put this way, the rapport between the mystery of Christ and the mystery of poetry seems quite naturally to invite a resolution along Rahnerian lines. I refer, of course, to Rana's 1959 lectures, The Concept of Mystery in Catholic Theology. He argues there that the various mysteries of Christianity are in fact extensions of the one fundamental mystery in which God communicates himself in and through Jesus Christ, and that this mystery offers itself to us in a vague and unthematic manner in transcendental experience. The question comes to be how we can best be open to receiving the mystery. One of Rana's most intriguing answers, though one bypassed by most of his commentators, is that we receive the mystery by way of an education in poetry. In his essay, Poetry and the Christian, we are told that the reading of poetry will help train our ears to hear the word. He says, in its inmost essence, the poetic is a prerequisite for Christianity. What Rana means by the poetic here is strong poetry, a category that does not exclude the simplest of poems. The medieval lyric, I sing of a maiden, for example, would count, I think, as a very strong poem. I take it as given that we can put aside a great deal of language poetry, sound poetry, the lubrications of the Cambridge School, and other equally transient writing. Poetry, for Rata, Rana, must be marked by an engagement with the human in its present historical moment, by an invitation to confront who and what one is here and now, and to recognize that the ground on which we stand cannot be dissociated from an abyss. Such poetry will remove us from everyday chatter, and attune us to the inexpressible at the heart of the expressible. It will make us better readers of scripture, better hearers of the liturgy, and in general, more finely attuned to the probing silence of the word. We Christians must love and fight for the poetic word, Rana says, because we must defend what is human, since God himself has assumed it into his eternal reality. These are very fine words, and part of me would like to subscribe to them. Yet Rana's theological method renders the argument of poetry in the Christian somewhat circular. Seen from a distance, Rana's theology is a massive, erudite, and subtle elaboration of the Pauline figure of Epictetus pressing forward, cast in the register of the post-Kantian transcendental. To be sure, it's conditioned along the way by St. Gregory of Nyssa, and especially in its interesting late phase by a mysticism derived from St. Ignatius Loyola. Rana's transcendental termism seems able to solve religious pluralism, at least as a topic in the theology of religions, but at the cost of granting a methodological privilege to revealability over revelation. It is too high a price, for Christianity stands or falls on the positive revelation of God in Jesus Christ. For Rana, essentially the same thing can happen in writing a poem as in an exemplary act of courage or loyalty. Now, a poem can enthrone mystery, if we take that word to denote supernatural mystery, although I think that's very rare indeed. You find it in Herbert and Hopkins. You don't find it in Montale or Transtrema, wonderful writers though they are. More often, and no less impressive, is when a poem performs strangeness, not merely the deployment of an alienation effect, as in Russian formalism, but an exposure to the fragility of things. Heidegger was sensitive to this in his reading of the German poets, and is sometimes the case, at least in his earlier work, Rana is most himself when having misread Heidegger. Next to Rana's theology of poetry, let me place Eliot's, T.S. Eliot's, sober words in his essay of 1945, The Social Function of Poetry. He distinguishes there between the decline of religious belief and the decline of religious sensibility, and I quote, the trouble of the modern age is not merely the inability to believe certain things about God and man, which our forefathers believed, but the inability to feel toward God and man as they did. A belief in which you no longer believe is something which to some extent you can still understand. But when religious feeling disappears, the words in which men have struggled to express it become meaningless. I read these lines in part 
there's an oblique reflection on a hope for the four quartets and a fear for them as well. The hope is that those poems will keep alive a certain religious feeling, roughly an Anglo-Saxon, sens Anglo-Catholic sensibility, that in turn will support high Anglican beliefs. And the fear is that nothing, not even a work as grand as the four quartets, can do that. The refined mysticism of Little Gidding will be appreciated as poetry, not as religious feeling. I think that Eliot is talking here more of empathy than of feeling, at least feeling in the sense that comes down to us from Schleiermacher, and that still characterizes much liberal religious practice inside and outside the Catholic Church. To have a sense of other people's thoughts and emotions is essential, for without that sort of imaginative activity, there can be no moral life. Yet empathy is too thin and too precarious to uphold religious belief. I do not go to Mass because I have an empathy with those who are consoled and elevated by the liturgy, but because I regard the Eucharist as the place where Jesus Christ manifests himself in bread and wine and where I'm called to worship him. My love of poetry does not help me in the Mass. If anything, it sometimes hinders me. Considered as poetry, or sometimes even as English, the post-Vatican II liturgies are weak pieces of writing. For poetry, one must go to the old rite, and one must have some Latin in one's bones. And it's worth remembering that Rana's reflections on poetry in the Christian would have been written with the old rite in mind. If the new rite lacks poetry, it also often fails to communicate the mystery of the divine. The two things are often confused, although they're quite different in principle. Part of the impetus to forge a new rite was, we're told, to eliminate mystification in the old rite. No amount of mystification, however, can reduce mystery, since mystery is never the consequence of mystification. A sense of mystery can be lost or forgotten, as Eliot and Heidegger agree, and that happens when insufficient attention is given to the transcendence of the divine. It seems to me that we live in a moment characterized by two responses to transcendence. In the church, transcendence has become little more than a thesis. We give notion or assent to it, but in general we do not approach the altar or prayer in awe. So much prayer in America seems to be addressed not to the God who exists a se, but to a very approachable personal trainer for eternal life. <laughs> Meanwhile, in some advanced philosophical and theological circles, transcendence is not set in religion, but in ethics. It is the other person's elevation above me that truly marks transcendence, we're told, and the transcendence of God is secondary with respect to that. The distinction between human converse and prayer is thereby divided and rendered equivocal. Such is what we now call, in theology, religion without religion, which to my mind is a variation on the Enlightenment understanding of religion as a genus and the positive faith as species. On the one hand, ethics is used to cast doubt on the primacy of worship, while on the other hand, it is used to discredit art. The fear of beauty, in religion, as in art, runs very deep, and ethics has become the neutral corner to which people retreat when they're afraid. There are, of course, many reasons to be afraid. Years ago, Geoffrey Hartman, who remains one of our most acute readers, spoke of poetry in terms of words that wound. We expect so much of words, he says, we look to them to define and clarify, and we are hurt by their equivocal nature, a situation that can lead to recoil to a dismissal of the power of words. Our ears are so vulnerable that we must do all we can to protect them. Banks, supermarkets, doctor surgeries, even restaurants. Wherever one goes, there's the mild drug of innocuous music or daytime TV set almost too low to hear. The cliché is that modernity made its way by shocking the eye, and perhaps its equivalent is that postmodernity has its way with us by tranquilizing the ear. Literary criticism can and should do many things. Minimally, though, it should address itself to this situation. It should concern itself with the power of words to wound us by going further than we thought they might, or less than we hoped they would, or indeed doing both at the same time. Before it is the mystery that enthrones, before it is the language that cures, poetry is the language that wounds. Alongside Hartman's reflection on poetry, I would place Jean-Louis Chrétien's meditation on verbal prayer as wounded language. Chrétien is not concerned with poetry as wounding us by dint of the equivocal nature of words. Rather, he fastens on the ways in which prayer affects the one who prays. I overhear myself praying, and I am struck by the way in which my language recoils on me with such force. 
It is an ordeal to realize that God is listening to our prayer, is always and already listening, attentive to each word, the weight of each silence, each hesitation, each breath. Prayer denudes the human voice, strips it naked, and utterly exposes its speaker, and of course its language is inadequate to the task of addressing the transcendent deity. Our response cannot measure up to the call that precedes it. We are mortal, we are sinful, we are spiritually poor. As Wallace Stevens says in his great poem to Santayana, it is poverty speech that seeks us out the most. One of Chrétien's merits is that he codes our spiritual poverty as affirmative rather than negative. Wounded language becomes the site where we can testify to the manifestation of the divine. Our prayer engages us body and soul, calls forth all our voices, private and public, lyrical and sober. Were one to explore those poems that are also prayers, one would find a language that is doubly wounded, marked by the equivocal and exposed to an ear that misses nothing and that probes what we do not wish to say, even to ourselves. Perhaps this gives us a starting point for reading epiphanies of beauty in poems such as the Holy Sonnets of Donne or Hopkins' lyrics or Geoffrey Hill's Lacrimae. To do so requires not only a certain skill in reading poetry, but also an education in the theology of prayer. But otherwise, it requires a double negotiation, the resistance that strong poetry puts forth to transcendence, for poetry is always pulled back to the imminence of language, and, as Shah says, the furious ascension to God. To reflect on the two approaches to wounded words, one oriented to poetry and the other to prayer, is perhaps to come to a renewed understanding of Lectio Divina. It would be a historical irony indeed were one of the consequences of the literary theory inspired by Nietzsche were to be a deeper sense of divine reading and an expanded sense of prayer. Yet it is so. My favorite passage of Nietzsche comes from the preface to Daybreak, where he talks of philology. He says, it is the art which demands of its votaries one thing above all, to go aside, to take time, to become still, to become slow. It is a goldsmith's art and connoisseurship of the word which has nothing but delicate, cautious work to do and achieves nothing if it does not achieve it lento. But for precisely this reason, it is more necessary than ever today. By precisely this means does it entice and enchant us the most in the midst of an age of work, that is to say of hurry, of indecent, perspiring haste, which wants to get everything done at once, including every old or new book. This art does not so easily get anything done. It teaches us to read well, that is to say, to read slowly, deeply, looking cautiously before and aft, with reservations, with doors left open, with delicate eyes and fingers. Those words are almost enough to make me a Nietzschean, but not quite. What I retain from the grand adventure of theory in which the name of Nietzsche was so often cited, is a recovery of Lectio Divina, which is also a recovery of prayer in a more general sense than is common today, even in the Catholic world. One person whose name was often linked, sometimes polemically, with Nietzsche was Jacques Derrida. By a remarkable argument, Derrida was able to show that meaning is supported by absence just as well as by presence. One could read secular literature as closely as Origin or Bonaventure, read scripture, not because poetic genius is the equivalent of divine inspiration, or because an ode by Keats is as metaphorically dense as the canticle, but because it is text. The argument takes hold at the second order, and for my purposes today it doesn't concern me how it meshes with first order propositions with respect to literature or scripture. What matters, rather, is the renewed attention to what is on the page and the possibility of folding that emphasis into an ancient practice of the church. To slow down reading so that one is attentive to scripture or commentary, to the meanings that press forward in time to come, backwards into time past, and to do so in the awareness that one reads in the breath of God. That is to resist the post-Christian culture of speed. As Henri de Lubac taught us before Vatican II, mystery is something one can approach through reading of this sort, and not only through privileged experiences, if they are experiences that we associate with the mystics. Let me step back from such grand thoughts to something closer to home. I do not think that poetry usually conducts mystery in the sense of supernatural mystery, and if it does, it has nothing to do with the intent of the poet. Yet poems can have a mission and can indeed conduct the mystery of Christ. 
Let me conclude by telling you a story that made this plain to me. It begins years ago when I wrote a short poem called The Room. I remember the writing the poem because it gave me more trouble than usual. Here is the poem. It's quite short. It is my room, and yet one, ro and yet one door is locked. The dark has taken root on all four walls. It is a room where not stare out from wood, a room that turns its back on the whole house. At night I hear the crickets list their griefs and let an ancient peace come into me. Sleep intercepts my prayer and in the dark the house turns slowly round its one closed room. I wrote the poem in 1991, I think, and it appeared in my new and selected poem several years later. Long before it was published, in a book, the poem had withdrawn from me, as usually happens. So I was taken quite by surprise when one evening in 2000, the phone went, and someone wanted to talk urgently with me about it. The man spoke English with a heavy Spanish accent, and it turned out that he was from Chile. He had only recently arrived in Australia, and he found my telephone number easily. He told me that some years ago in Chile, he had encountered the room, along with several other of my poems, in Spanish translation. It seems that a bishop had read them to a group of Catholics who were involved in activities frowned upon by the state. However, in Spanish and in the specific political and spiritual context that I cannot recover, the poems, and especially the room, took on a resonance that was unfamiliar even to its author. The man on the telephone said that he and several of his friends learned the poem by heart in Spanish. Later, they were arrested and put in prison where they were tortured. Each day in his cell, he recited the room in Spanish to himself. He told me that it brought Christ close to him. And now that he was free, he wanted to call me and tell me that. And then he said goodbye and put down the phone. I was moved then, and I move now when I recollect the story. I'm struck that a poem I know very well was able to make to take on a significance unintended by me in another language and in a terrible situation. I was intrigued by what the man had heard in the poem in its new Spanish life and puzzled that I didn't hear the same things. As I reflected on this telephone conversation, I thought first of all that anything can be charged with the mystery of Christ when God takes it into his care. Mystery in poetry is perhaps not so much inspiration as expiration. And then I thought, how strange a thing is mission. The work that I did on the poem was finite, bothered by solving a tight, a slight technical problem. Yet once out of my hands, the poem did not cease to work. I do nothing to help people being tortured in prison in Chile, but my poem kept working in another culture, in another language, to bring comfort of a kind that I can scarcely imagine. We do not know the extent of any work that we may do, and I do not think we should think of it. The essential work that we, might, that we do might happen long after our deaths, after lives that were lived with modest aims, and the work will be done by the Holy Spirit, not simply by us. Perhaps it is there that we can recognize the coincidence of mystery and mission. Thank you. Our second speaker is Ralph McInerney, Professor of Philosophy, Michael P. Grace, Professor of Medieval Studies, and the Director of the Jacques Maritain Center, University of Notre Dame. How do you introduce an individual like Ralph McInerney to an audience at such an occasion as this? A man who this year is completing his 50th year at Notre Dame, a man who has received more professional honors, perhaps, than all of us combined in the room, and a man who has published about 100 books. Well, for our purposes today, and in a fully nonpartisan sense, my introduction is going to be on the order of 
Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. So, ladies and gentlemen, to speak on the subject of the epiphany of fiction, Ralph McInerney. Thank you, Don. I was waiting for hail to the chief. <laughs> I call these remarks uh, the epiphany of fiction. It would be too much to say that whoever hears the word epiphany must think of James Joyce. Uh, to give him ownership of a word that for millennia has had such rich religious significance might seem akin to distraction at one's prayers. For all that, some of us, for our sins, pretty quickly do make that secular connection and have been doing it during more than half a century that has elapsed since first reading Dubliners and reading about Joyce, of course, first in Harry Levin's study, where Joyce's appropriation of the word epiphany is much discussed. Oliver St. John Gogarty tells of Joyce going about with a notebook in which under epiphany he recorded, quote, any showing forth of the mind by which he considered one gave himself away. And epiphany, of course, is originally a spiritual manifestation, the manifestation of the God-man to the Magi. But in the hands of Joyce, according to Levin, it becomes a literary substitute for the revelation of religion. Though grounded in theology, it has now become a literary technique. It has become, he goes on, Joyce's contribution to that series of developments which convert narrative into short story, supplant plot with style, and turn the raconteur into a candid camera expert. Well, I'll leave to the critics and other professionals the joys of interpreting the specifics of Joyce's technique. It is surely to take nothing away from a great writer to notice as in his way Levin does, that what Joyce has hit upon is a variation of something that seems at the very heart of fiction. To elucidate the point, let me put before you two writers who, at first blush, will seem very different from James Joyce. First of all, Flannery O'Connor, and not least because she, like Joyce, was enamored of Thomas Aquinas read a little of the Summa every day, she says, and called herself a hillbilly Thomas. Joyce, we remember, made his own Thomas's definition of the beautiful as that which, when seen, pleases, as well as those characteristics of the seen thing that engender pleasure, or as Joyce sometimes puts it, satisfaction, integritas, consonancia, claritas, wholeness, harmony, radiance. <clears throat> the artist, as Conrad said, above all wants to make us see and, of course, to guide our response to what is seen. But I was about to say some things about Flannery O'Connor. The few things we have from her on her writing, on writing as such, on Catholic writing, most of them talks she gave here and there are among the best things a young writer could read. She described the South as Christ-haunted, and so is her fiction, because it is about the South. It may seem odd to find such Catholic fiction develop in what Mencken disdainfully called the Bible Belt. How can such grotesque creatures convey the mystery of faith? When her mother complained to her that she wrote only about grotesque people, her answer was, we are all grotesque, meaning, I suppose, that we are all sinners. Consider this remark of hers. We Catholics are much given to the instant answer. Fiction doesn't have any. St. Gregory wrote that every time the sacred text describes a fact, it reveals a mystery. And this is what the fiction writer, on his lower level, attempts to do. Somewhere else that I could not find when I was writing this, she says that all literature is anagogic. This is an arresting remark. 
but perhaps less so in the light of the passage just quoted. The anagogic is one of the non-literal senses of scripture, distinguished from the allegorical and the moral senses. Flannery O'Connor did not parade her learning, but we can be sure, I think, that she knew precisely what she was saying. The anagogic sense refers to our ultimate destiny in the next world. So she can be taken to mean that her very concrete, very definite, often grotesque stories are meant to suggest the realm of grace in terms of which they have their real meaning. They are, let us use the word, epiphanies. Now, there is a pretty authoritative precedent for the artist thus applying the niceties of scriptural exegesis to his own products. Was Dante the first to do this? In La Vita Nova onward into Il Convivio, he gives us poems and then a prosaic interpretation of them. In the latter work, The Banquet, he explicitly invokes the senses of scripture and applies them to his own poetry. The Divine Comedy, of course, is simply poetry, but in the dedicatory letter to Con Grande della Scala, Dante spells out the literal and then the allegorical senses of his great poem. Before doing that, he provides us with an account of the literal, moral, allegorical, and anagogical senses of a scriptural verse. For his own purposes, he needs only two senses, the allegorical standing for the other non-literal senses as well. Applying this to his own great poem, he writes that the literal sense is simply the state of souls after death. The allegorical meaning, on the other hand, is that we human beings, by the use of our free will, determine our eternal state of punishment or bliss. The journey through hell and purgatory and into paradise is Dante's and our spiritual awakening. In a way that we, might, we may find puzzling, Dante says that the Divine Comedy is a work of moral philosophy. So we have three writers, Joyce, O'Connor, and Dante, all speaking of their art in a somewhat similar way. It is a bonus that they were all Catholics, at least of a sort, and more or less Thomas. Someone has said that literary criticism is biblical interpretation in a degenerate or secularized mode. What Harry Levin says about Joyce's use of epiphany seems to underwrite that, in his case, art being a deliberate substitute for the religious. That would make the Joycean epiphany explicitly a declension from the religious or scriptural sense of the term. But I think with Dante and Flannery O'Connor, there is far more affinity with biblical exegesis. But whatever their differences in this matter, they may seem to be special cases, very special cases, of the literary artist. But perhaps not too special. Let me pursue this. Why do grown-up human beings spend so much time reading about the imaginary deeds of imaginary characters? Put that way, reading and writing fiction can seem a pretty trivial affair. <clears throat> once, <clears throat> when I was, <clears throat> once when I was on a panel at a meeting of medievalists, a colleague whispered to me while the other panelists were speaking, someone told me you've written a novel. It's not true, is it? Uh, I understood the scholarly horror in his eyes. His voice seemed to emerge from some dusty library where heavy tomes deal only with serious matter. No, I answered. I've written several. <laughs> I might have been confessing my sins. The whole matter can become less suspect for such a person when we remind ourselves that philosophers have long considered the underlying question. Plato spoke of an ancient quarrel between poetry and philosophy, but since he was the most artful and poetic of philosophers, we are not surprised to find that he is criticizing some poems and commending others. Aristotle, that most prosaic of philosophers, and as Dante said, the master of those who know, 
listed the platonic dialogues among the works he hoped to deal with in his poetics, that little unfinished work that is the phones at Arrigo of literary criticism. Aristotle clearly takes works of the imagination with the greatest seriousness. Only an inveterate playgoer could have had the empirical base that sustains his discussion of tragedy. Perhaps the deepest of its unstated messages is that philosophy is not enough for us. Our mind may be at home in abstraction, but that very statement involves a metaphor depending on the literal meaning of home as somewhere we, and not just our minds, can dwell. Art is the realm of the concrete, of the particular, of these characters, this place, this dilemma. As spectators, we are drawn into the enacted imaginary drama. Our emotions are engaged. And if the play is successful, something happens to us that Aristotle called purgation. The power of imitated action is that it suggests, even if it does not state its meaning, and that meaning is what transcends the particularities of the play, transcends but is not divorced from them. I'm not given to quoting Hegel, but his concept of the concrete universal seems right. For Aristotle, it was the plot, the mythos, the myth that revealed that the actions depicted have a beginning, a middle, and an end. The end is the resolution of the dilemma the protagonists face, and the resolution reconciles us to the mysteries and vagaries of human action. Real acts are obscure to us, obscure even to their agents, but imitated action has a wholeness, a harmony, a clarity that satisfies. Well, if Flannery O'Connor's remarks about what she is doing as a writer seem less and less applicable to fiction generally, <clears throat> something she foresaw. <clears throat> this is not simply because she was professedly a Catholic writer. Even more, she was a re regional writer in a quite unapologetic way. Indeed, it was her conviction that the best of American fiction has been regional. She wrote, unless the novelist has gone utterly out of his mind, always, of course, a possibility, his aim is still communication, and communication suggests talking inside a community. She likes Walker Percy's explanation of why Southern fiction flourished, because we lost the war. That's not just a quip, but points to the experience of a fall, of the fall, of the ineradicable mystery of misfortune and evil that permeates human life. Without a sense of sin and of our creatureliness, grace will be absent. We grasp the remedy, however obliquely, when we understand the evil to be remedied, the sinner to be redeemed. Now, to speak of her as a Southern Catholic writer may seem to remove Flannery O'Connor twice from the writer to poor, what possible significance for the writer as such could her reflections on her own writing have? For that matter, what continuing relevance do the assumptions of Aristotle about imaginative art, to say nothing of Dante's, have nowadays? O'Connor noticed the artistic emptiness of fiction produced by the isolated individual, a writer without any community, to whom he might communicate. In our fractured culture, she wrote, we cannot agree on morals. We cannot even agree that moral matters should come before literary ones when there is a conflict between them. That, I think you will agree, is a radically countercultural remark. I suppose Flannery O'Connor could get published today only because her stories would be taken to be put-downs of her characters an Olympian account of the ignorant and unwashed. There is no guarantee that a writer will be read on his own terms. Perhaps the stories in Dubliners are often read now as nostalgic evocations of a lost better city than as epiphanies of the futility of Dublin life. 
think of the movie that was made of the dead. Today, the Catholic writer faces, I think, a situation analogous to that faced by Catholic colleges and universities. The latter are thought by many to be on the path to secularization, anxious to be ranked and accepted by once prestigious institutions still thought to be the Bureau of Standards. Criteria for success are sought outside the great tradition in which we supposedly stand. Catholic universities become less and less Catholic in their defining activities, the life of the mind and the life of the imagination. There is a vulgarity in this drive to be accepted on a basis that seems antithetical to the purpose of a Catholic university. Well, that's a large topic, of course, and I introduce it here only as an analog of the situation of the Catholic writer now. If Joyce removed the conception of epiphany from the religious realm, it retained some vestige of the role it played for Dante long ago and for Flannery O'Connor just yesterday. But what epiphanies are to be found in mainstream fiction? What larger sense of the meaning of life guides them and provides them with standards of interpretation that could be merely presupposed? What wider community can the contemporary writer communicate with? Another large question, but it is one any writer, but above all, I think, a Catholic writer, should ask himself. It is not rare, of course, to find <clears throat> the contemporary literary critic displaying Western literature as a dying fall. We find a form of this in John Kerry's The Intellectuals and the Masses, 1992, in which modernity in fiction is seen as a deliberate obfuscation to keep the unwashed reader at bay, a deliberate thwarting of the usual expectations of the reader. Hugh Kenner celebrates these developments in his disarming rah-rah way. And of course, there is Harold Bloom. There is always Harold Bloom. <laughs> I think of a book of his I have come upon only lately, however, Ruin the Sacred Truths, which appeared in 1989 which moves from the Hebrew Bible through Homer and Dante, Shakespeare and Milton to end with that minimalist of all minimalists, Samuel Beckett. What have epiphanies become? Here is Bloom. In his early monograph, Proust, Beckett cites Schopenhauer's definition of the artistic procedure as the contemplation of the world independently of the principle of reason. Such more than rational contemplation, Beckett writes, gives Proust those Ruskian or Paterian privileged moments that are epiphanies in Joyce, but which Beckett mordantly calls fetishes in Proust. Transcendental bursts of radiance necessarily are no part of Beckett's cosmos. Well, Beckett on Beckett is even more interesting. What are we to make of a writer whose work is done under the slogan that it would have been better not to have been born at all? Christopher Rick's little book, Beckett's Dying Words, is a sympathetic and entertaining reflection on the central assumption of Beckett's work. But what kind of fiction is it that conveys the belief that life is meaningless, death is a deliverance, in non-being something to wax nostalgic about. Some may remember Albert Camus' discussion of absurdity in art and of the possibility of an absurd novel. Many thought Camus' own novels could be called that. He saw that the project, Camus saw that the project of the absurd novel is itself absurd. A story that hopes to show that there is no meaning in life has that meaning. The very nature of the novel, this seems to be the suggestion, absorbs into itself this effort to subvert it, making it another instance of what the novel does. To this can be added, I think, the image of Beckett plugging away year after year, producing his fascinating work. Why did he do it? There may be an existential as well as an aesthetic contradiction in what he is doing. If nothing else, it requires the foil of meaning to have something to kick against. Perhaps 
that is why even malgré nous, we enjoy Beckett as much as we do. One could throw into this mix Umberto Eco's account of the death of the Grupo 63 and other reports from various regions of the apocalypse. Where in all this can T.S. Eliot's tradition and the individual talent still be made to fit? Despite all the gloom, there persists a dogged devotion to what Bloom displayed in the Western canon. And as a notable example, there is Jorge Luis Borges lectures The Craft of Verse. Well, I am no literary critic, nor is this idle boasting. Uh, any writer must place himself in a wider hole, and the holes that abound today are pretty fragmented. Still, there persists the belief that the great grand thing continues in diaspora, and there can be found many writers circling the volcano, dancing out of range of the consuming lava, producing countercultural work that connects, however subtly, with what Eliot called the tradition. Like our educational institutions, the Catholic writer has resources that derive from that tradition, and the tragedy to be avoided is to jettison those resources and become a spear carrier in a nihilistic chorus. Well, apart from taking refuge in the mystery novel, that last bastion of shared standards for appraising action, what is a young Catholic writer to do? My personal advice would be, be as Catholic as you can be. Let your themes and characters and settings be explicitly Catholic, or at least write with the assumptions of a Flannery O'Connor. Of course, a lot of recent so-called Catholic fiction has been written by lapsed or disaffected Catholics telling their readers how mean Sister Esmeralda was. Joycean, in their way, I suppose, or even more, James T. Farrell and the Ashcan tradition. Perhaps that sort of thing is not taken seriously as fiction. Good Catholic fiction may still be read by those who cannot share its assumption, read as a report from an exotic quarter out of the mainstream, but somehow fascinating. One could, of course, be as devious as Walker Percy in the Thanatos Syndrome and portray opposition to the zeitgeist as a kind of madness, as indeed it must seem to many. In short, the Catholic writer may not be accepted on his own terms, <clears throat> but if he does his job well, the epiphanies intrinsic to his work can still be effective. Just as there are vestiges about of the common morality that once sustained our society, so the faith is in diaspora. In all but unconscious hunger for the faith is everywhere. I like to remember that it was a novel that saved Jacques and Raisa Samaritan from suicide. Thanks to the assumptions of the Sorbonne courses they were taking, they had come to think of life as meaningless and contemplated ending it. And then they read Léon Blois' The Woman Who Was Poor, in which they encountered the sentence, There is only one tragedy, not to be a saint. That was an epiphany for them. Finally, it is the only one that makes fiction literature. Thank you. All right, questions and comments. Would you please direct them to um, one of the speakers, or you might want to direct a question or comment to both. You're welcome to do that. Or to neither. Or not to neither. <laughs> Who will begin? I'll take a quick one to both of you, actually. Um, since Dr. McInerney addressed mostly fiction and Kevin that you were addressing uh, lyric poetry, um, I wanted to ask a question that actually comes out of 
Dr. McIntyre's talk this morning, though I think it went more or less unspoken then. That is, what's the, within a literature, say, that's specifically Catholic, or maybe I should say within a literature that wants to represent some kind of epiphany, whether as experience or concept, what, how do you see that in relation to the different specific genres of writing? And I don't mean to say the detective novel versus the epic, but rather say the lyric poem, which tends by and large to sort of exclude narrative, and then the longer narratives that we see more today in the form of novels, no longer so much in poetry. But in other words, what's the role of narrative, per se, and also the lyric in conveying religious experience? I hate to use that general term, but I will. You might have heard the question. I was trying to read your lips. Is this on? Is this on? Yes. Can you hear me? Insofar as I heard the question, I didn't hear McIntyre's talk this morning, so if you're testing me on that, I fail, okay? Could you summarize the question? Well, I'll let Professor Hart. I take it that James is asking, is there a difference between narrative prose and lyric poetry with regard to epiphanies? Narrative? Narrative prose, as you were speaking about. Oh. I was speaking about poetry. Oh. Well, of course. Poetry is so much more intense. You know, Frank O'Connor once said that all writers want to be poets, and when they find they can't write poems, they turn to novels or short stories. But you end up writing mysteries, huh? You mentioned the lyric poem particularly. It's the intensity of it, I think, that would make the difference, and it's probably in many ways more subtle than less subtle. Is that obscure enough? I think I'd agree in general with that remark. The expression that comes to my mind is one of Eberhard Jungl's, the Lutheran theologian, when he talks of an Erfahrung mit der Erfahrung, an experience with experience. And I think what you find in great literature, irrespective of its genre, is it enables you to revalue, rethink, reorganize, reset, rejig your own experience so that you can have an idea of what your experience amounts to. And that gives what he calls a miracle and what we might call in terms of this conference an epiphany. But I think it's invariant with respect to great literature. If you find it more intensely in lyrical poetry, which I think you do, you might find it also in certain moments of Henry James or Richardson or Dickens, where something, by virtue of the fact that it's surrounded by prose, gleams, and you notice it all the more instantly. This is a somewhat technical question for Professor McInerney, and it comes from the experience of reading the Jesuit poet Gerard Manley Hopkins. And in his training in the Jesuits toward ordination, specifically in theology and in philosophy, he discovered himself attracted to Duns Scotus and his notion of hexietas, which became in Hopkins the notion of inscape, that the particularity shines through to such an extent. And so drawn was he to Scotus in the time of almost legislated Thomism that it rather isolated Hopkins from his order, and he was kind of marginalized in many ways. But I think those who are familiar enough with Scotus and with Hopkins can see the debt that Hopkins owes to Scotus with the connection between hexietas and inscape. Now my question is, given that technical background, I can never detect, what specifically did Flannery O'Connor draw from Thomas? I know she read a little bit of the Summa each evening, but I've never been able to detect a specifically Thomas vision in her fiction. Can you? Sure. I can see it everywhere. It's a Rorschach test. 
No, she doesn't cite the SOMA, to the best of my knowledge, except in her letters. But one of the things that really moved her about the influence of Thomas on her was reading Maritain's Art and Scholasticism, which is, I think by all accounts, one of Maritain's dullest books, but it's had more impact on working artists than anything probably any philosopher has written. And what struck her was the Aristotelian definition of art that Maritain worked with, namely that art is the perfection of the thing made. And that freed her from the notion that she picked up probably at the Iowa Writers' School that writing was self-expression. And it was the objectivity of the thing that got her. Now, she knew that if you do that, your voice is going to come through, and probably ever more distinctively because you're not trying to do that. So that would be an oblique and more Aristotelian probably than a Thomistic thing. But the thing on Hopkins, it seems to me, from a philosophical point of view, I've often thought there's no more abstract word than hachetas or thisness. But what it's after, of course, is the most concrete thing of all. But when you try to express those things abstractly, you do get even more abstract trying to express individuality. It becomes a common term, in short, rather than pointing to the unique. But Inscape was his version of epiphany, wasn't it? And so, you know, theoretically it seems to me that won't work because if you're drawn philosophically in the direction of thinking that each thing has its own essence, and that leads very quickly to determinism. If everything I do and think is part of my essence, freedom is rather hard to accommodate. You asked for this. Two questions. I think the first one is for Kevin. You were drawing a contrast between Christian culture, which is attentive, slow, deep in its reading of books and experience, and post-Christian culture, which is fast and superficial and takes us away from ourselves and others and God. And as you were speaking, I was thinking about the story of Simone Weil's experience when she memorized the poem by Herbert and was just reciting it slowly to herself over and over until suddenly the poem became a prayer. And that experience was one of a kind of a continuity between poetry and prayer and then eventually to the scriptures. Okay, so as I was thinking about this, this raised two questions. The first one is practical. How can we proceed pedagogically to slow down our experience of reading, of interpretation? What would you suggest pedagogically? And then the second question is more theoretical, and I would address this to both of you. What model do you have in mind when you're speaking about the relationship between secular writing and the scriptures? Is it a matter of some kind of an analogy that we have things going on that are analogous in the two books? Or is it more of a matter of some kind of continuity where there's a kind of a reductio that's drawing us back to the scriptures themselves as a privileged text? Okay. Very quickly, in terms of pedagogy, I think it's quite easy to do. You actually set for study far less than you think should be done. There's always, I find if one teaches a 14-line poem and does it well, then students go away with a lot more. I mean, the main thing that I try to do when I teach whatever else I end up teaching is to enable students to read confidently by themselves when they're no longer in the classroom. And the only way one can do that, I think, is to go very slowly through a poem. I think that one of the things I was saying today is that one of the 
ironic consequences of a great deal of literary theory of the 70s and 80s is that it leads to a, a new interest in Lectio Divina, a, a slow reading of, of, of scripture and, and, and the fathers. And, it, and it's the, the intent of all of it was the exact opposite, um, but, but it has that ir ironic consequence. Um, so there is one kind of um, uh, odd relay between the sacred and the secular that occurs. The borderlines between the sacred and the secular in terms of formation of canons are very divided and equivocal. Um, I, I won't go on and on about particular texts in, in the Bible and, and how they come in and out um, over, over the first few centuries of the common era, but literary criticism keeps trying endlessly to form canons which are the secular equivalent of scripture and to act in at least as self-righteous a manner with respect to them as any cleric. Um, and all I can say is that um, the best thing if you're a professor of English is to be born with a very large portion of, of irony. <coughs> yeah, I like the notion of a, of a continuum or a spectrum. Uh, I was always struck by the implications of C.S. Lewis's uh, lectures that were published as Experiment and Criticism, where he asked, what is literature? And uh, uh, it was as if there was a contrast between uh, books that are kind of in the canon and what we read most of the time. And he was wondering, what is the relationship? If, if literature is going to be a kind of medicinal thing, you need three credits of this, and meanwhile people go off and read other things. I mean, you can just say, well, there's literature and junk, and most people prefer junk, but he didn't do that. And he offered as a sort of thumbnail definition of what literature is, anything you would read again. And then he asked, well, what are the things that would bring us back? And out of that emerged that uh, there are a lot of things that uh, we read again. So you've got a kind of falling away. It's not an egalitarian or leveling uh, use, but uh, uh, you move away from the undeniably greatest uh, instances in a genre down to the very humble ones. And there are some things we'd only read once, some things we wouldn't read even once. Huh? But it, it's, it's kind of nice to see that because then we're, we understand, I think, why it is at different moments and in different moods we, we enjoy different things. Uh, we don't read Tolstoy every day. Huh? We read P.G. Woodhouse some days. Huh? And uh, it's good to do both. If we think of the perfection of the thing, of the thing made, uh, as uh, rather than looking for what's the point of May this? I have your attention, please. The time is now 3:10 and the end of the current session. Do you hear a voice? We have a couple of announcements. <laughs> we have a book signing by Professor Michael Scaperlanda in the book room. He'll be signing his book, The Journey: A Guide for the Modern Pilgrim. <laughs> I thought it was also, the people taking the Snipe Museum tour should be at the Snipe Museum by 3.40. It's building number 54 on your campus map and a quick two-minute walk from this building. Thank you. Did the rest of you hear a voice? <laughs> All right, the last question. If we think of the perfection of the thing made uh, rather than what's the point of this or what lesson do we get or who did it, uh, shouldn't we possibly send people back to school at about age 50 to reread the stuff that they made us read as undergraduates, because perhaps then we have a better idea of the perfections and the imperfections of the thing that we read to pass an exam when we were young. <laughs> That's why some of us have gone back to teaching. <laughs> Comments? You sir. Um, uh, uh, I, I agree entirely with, with, that, with that chairman that uh, the, the best way to, um, to learn is to teach. It's just um, withheld from the young. Right, right. Thank you, audience, and let's thank our speakers.